Good morning. morning. And Pastor Steve Brown, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, I look forward to that opportunity. So here's a question I want you to answer for yourself as we go into sermon today. Is there an area of your life that you think is seems to be falling apart? If so, I want you to think about that. Maybe it's something that happened in the past, an area of your life that you remember in the past has kind of fallen apart. Or maybe that's never happened to you. So if that's the case, uh, at your next birthday when you turn age three, that might be a thing. So what is something that you kind of start freaking out about when it seems like it's kind of falling apart? I'm going to invite you to watch a movie clip from the movies Monsters, Inc. Who's seen Monsters, Inc.? A lot more people raising their hand in this service than the earlier one. So the premise of this movie is here's these monsters. Now, it's a movie. It's not real. It's a movie, guy, little guys, okay? Um, and the monsters work in his factory, and they have these doors, and it's the doors to kids' bedrooms, and they go through the doors, and they try to scare the kids. The kids scream, and they collect the screams. And when they collect the screams, that's like they're, what they're trying to produce, and they capture them in these yellow canisters, Okay? But here's another thing about the monsters you don't realize is they're kind of freaked out by the kids. And if, if they get touched by one of the kids, they think they're going to, like, die or something, right? So watch this clip. Well, Jerry, what's the damage so far? We may actually make our quota today, sir. Hmm. First time in a month. Huh? <laughs> what happened? The kid almost touched me. She got this close to me. She wasn't scared of you? She was only six! I could have been dead! I could have died! Keep it together, man! <laughs> So can you relate to that where you're freaking out and, and maybe inside of you because something's kind of falling apart in your life and inside of you you're saying, I got to hold it together, man. Or maybe someone say, hey, keep it together, man. You know the challenge with that is? Sometimes it's really hard to hold it together, especially when we think, you know, we got to hold it together ourselves on our own because some things some things we just can't control something that I like using a lot is a Jahari square right I use it a couple times in the past I'm using it again this is the one I use when it comes to some stressful experience in my life by the way you might want to get out your sermon outline follow along it's a teaching series and you might find this helpful I hope you do at least when I'm, try- when I'm facing a stress, when something seems to be falling apart, if I can put it in one of these squares, it helps me to know how to approach that. Because when my emotions are involved, then, you know, I'm not thinking real clearly. So you have two axes here. You have something that you're able to change and something that's difficult to change. And the other ax, something that is high importance and something that's low importance. So... Let me just go through these squares real quick. If it's something that's difficult to change and low importance, the question is, can you forget about it? Yes, Lord. Can you forget about it? Or just accept it because you don't want to spend more time. If it's something that you're able to change, low importance, that could be good, right? Uh, This week, our staff spent some time cleaning up the upstairs, and it was tremendously satisfying for me. You met all my order needs. But so sometimes those things that are low importance but you know able to change are kind of fun to do, they're satisfying. But the question is, are you spending too much time 
on something of low importance. Then you come to those that are the high importance, able to change. This is actually where we want to spend our time and best energy accomplishing things. And the question here is, what, and not can, what will you change to bring about a better thing in the high importance? And that's really the square. If it's in there, that's where you should spend your time. But it is this square, box number two, I should say, where we're talking about today when life seems to be falling apart, when you're freaking out and you're saying, or someone is saying to you, you got to hold it together, man. Because the question here is not what you can change, because if you could change, you'd do it. <laughs> but this is difficult to change. This is when the question is, how will you cope. How will you cope? How do Christians cope? How do followers of Jesus cope when life seems to be falling apart? How do we cope with that? In his letter, to the Christ followers living in the ancient city of Colossae, the Apostle Paul gave wisdom about living life and living it according to the commands of God and in connection with Jesus. He gave wisdom about what to do when life is hard and complicated, when things seem out of control. And if you could just summarize what he said in one line, it's, or one word, it's Jesus, right? Jesus is how we cope. Jesus is who we turn to to cope. Jesus is the one that holds us together. If you haven't read through the book of Colossians for this series, I encourage you to do that this week. This is how God is at work in our lives. Not just in the sky when we die, but now every day when we're facing those thing, things that seem that are falling apart, God reaches in and helps us to hold those together through Christ. So today we're learning this from the, Paul's letter to the Colossians. When life seems to be falling apart, God holds all things together in Christ for our good. That's the takeaway from today. When life seems to be falling apart, God holds all things together in Christ, that's an important part of it, for our good. This is how followers of Jesus cope. When we're in box number two, this is how we cope with it. When it's something we can't change or very difficult to change, it's high importance, it is our turning to God. This is the wisdom that Paul is teaching us in his letter today. Colossians was written by Paul when he was in prison in Rome. I mean, he's in one of those life is falling apart moments. He's in box number two. He can't do anything about it, right? When you're in prison, you're in prison. I think he had a sense, even though he talked in some of his letters, that he would come and see some folks. I think he kind of knew that that might not happen, and in fact, it did not. He ended up being uh, executed by the Roman Emperor Nero. He really never made it out of prison. It is written in about 60 AD. Now, here's the thing. When you read the New Testament, that you, it's helpful to always keep in mind. The New Testament, much if not all of it, all of it was written to Christ followers who sometimes and maybe often found themselves in box number two with something that was important and was difficult to change. You know what that was? It was that Jesus had not yet returned. They believed that Jesus was about to return. Why? Because he kind of said that when he was here. At one point he says, you know, this person's not going to die until I return. So they're thinking he's about to return, and he doesn't, and then what happens? Well, life happens. People start dying. 
Loved ones start dying. They get into situations where their life is out of control. They were thinking this was all about to be done with the past. And we're going to get, you know, all to heaven. And now time keeps going on. And, and now persecution is starting to happen, by the way. And so that, when you read the New Testament, it's helpful to have that in mind. Because that's what they're facing. And that's much of the New Testament writing is in part addressing that concern. Where the New Testament writers, Paul in particular, is encouraging folks, stay strong in the faith. Continue to trust that God is with you. Well, that's what's happening in Colossae. And what happens is there are some teachers in the church these weren't people outside the church. These were people that are part of the family of faith. Some of the teachers are starting to teach false teachings because they don't think it's false. They just think it's like the best thing to teach right now. And they're beginning to teach that, you know, maybe trusting in Jesus isn't enough. After all, look, he hasn't come back and these things are happening to you. And so... The followers of Jesus in Colossae are beginning to lose some hope because of these false teachers. Now again, they don't see themselves as false. They just think they're doing what's best to do, what's wise to do. Last week, Pastor Mike mentioned a couple of these false teachings, Gnosticism and Pelagianism. Now, it's important to remember that these weren't full-blown heresies at the time they were just the seeds of them are just starting there it wouldn't be for some time later that they would really be identified as heresies and and spoken against but the seeds are there and again remember this is happening within the church this isn't someone on the outside these are people within the room narcissism grew to be not so much a religion, but just kind of a, a, a system of thought. And you have to understand that it grew up right alongside Christianity. In fact, within the same community. We're not sure even of the origins of Gnosticism. Some of it guessed it actually is in Buddhism or other things. Gnosticism had this, and we, we know this from the own writings that we've dug up, is they had this dualism. They had a dualism when it comes to uh, human beings. They understood that, that there is this kind of transcendent, harmonious self inside of us as human beings that's trapped in this broken, corrupted physical body. And they just needed to kind of transcend that in order to you know, reach enlightenment or reach the good place. They had this, even this dualistic theology. They believed there were two different gods. There was the God of the Old Testament that was kind of a bad, evil God who created things corrupted. They didn't really pay a lot of attention to our agency in that in terms of sin. And then there was the good, you know, transcendent, real God. And that... Then the third characteristic, these are more like cliches or broad understandings that are difficult but to understand sometimes. And understand that it was, such a, it was a variety of teachings across the ancient Mediterranean. So it's not a uniform teaching. But these are some of the characteristics you can see from the writings. The third thing was this secret knowledge. That's where the word gnosis comes from, knowledge. And they saw Jesus as having given the secret knowledge. In fact, one of the writings said that Jesus was the one in the Garden of Eden that told Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you know, to get that secret knowledge. That's what they thought. And that having the secret knowledge was the way to eternal life. Now, how is that like today? And, and what's really the issue? Why is it because, why did it come identified as a heresy? Well, there's a lot of things there we could go into, but it's not a history lesson on Gnosticism. It's simply this. The emphasis is on what you do and what I do. Hold it together, man! I mean, the Gnostics would love that kind of thing. You know, just get it together. Keep it together. The emphasis is on you and what you do. Well, if you could hold it together on your own, <laughs> 
You would, right? You'd be like in box number one. But we're in box number two. Difficult to change. Those who later became known as those who followed Pelagius, Pelagianism, similar way. The idea there was that that God, it's not so much what God has done, but what you do. In some ways, you kind of meet God halfway. And so there were those in Colossae who, like the church in Galatia, were saying that what you need to do to kind of hold it together when life has fallen apart is to practice the Jewish rituals and, and seasons and worship you know, practice Judaism, the, the rituals and the, and the practices. In other words, hold it together. You see, you know what's wrong with both of these? Because we still have that today. What's wrong with both of these is they're not resting in the grace of what God has done in Christ. They're trying to rest in what we do. And where does that get us? I'm freaking out. I could have died, the monster said, if she touched me. So if that's kind of where you are at, you know, you're trying to hold it together on your own, let me ask a Dr. Phil question. How's that working out for you? <laughs> right? How's that? Is that working? What if you tried this instead? What if you rested in the grace and hope of this? When life seems to be falling apart, God holds all things together in Christ for our good. What if you held to that? And Paul now teaches that Jesus is sufficient to hold all things together in saying these things. The Son, that is Jesus, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That Jesus is God. He'd say in chapter 2 that in Christ all the fullness of God the deity lives in bodily form. In other words, Jesus isn't just a spirit, you know, a harmonious, perfect spirit. He's fully human. He's, he's fully physical and fleshly. That spoke right against that, the seeds of Gnosticism that saw this as corrupted. But that Jesus was both fully God, spirit, and fully human, physical. Paul continues saying this, For in him all things are created, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. That not only is Jesus with us as God, but Jesus is God. In the book of John, the first chapter says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that all things were created through him. That Jesus is the agent of creation. They created all that is because he's fully God. And therefore, he's reliable and sufficient for holding together the things in our life that he created. He's the one to put it together. So he knows how to hold it together for us. Paul continues to teach that Jesus is fully God, saying, Jesus, or God was pleased to have all the fullness. His fullness dwell in Jesus. The reason that follows that Jesus, when we get into box number two, and, and it's something that we can't control, and it's important, and it seems the life is falling apart, that we turn to Jesus, is because he's sufficient to hold it together for us and in us, in our lives. Even when we don't feel it, right? That's the, that's the rub, right? We may not feel like it, but it's still true. The truth of who Jesus is stands above our feelings. Now, we should be present with those feelings. We shouldn't deny the, the anxiety or the sadness that we have when things seem to be falling apart. In fact, it's important to be aware of those and be present with them. It doesn't help to deny them like they're not there. But we under, understand is that great, Jesus is greater than our feelings. Jesus stands above that. He has overcome the world, he says. Don't lose heart. Perfect love casts out fear, says the New Testament. 
So Paul teaches that he, that is Jesus, is before things and in him all things hold together. Followers of Jesus rest ourselves in this. And Paul knew this not just from his theology, but he knew it from his experience. He's in prison when he's writing this. Another t letter in the letter Corinthians, he talks about this thorn in the flesh that he had. It was some probably physical ailment. Maybe it was something emotional. We don't know what it is. People have speculated what it is. You know, irritable bowel syndrome or epilepsy or something to do with an eye or maybe it was an emotional thing. We have all kinds of speculation. You know, people write their doctor dissertations about what that thorn in the flesh was. We don't know. We do know this from his writings that he pleaded with God over and over and over again, take this thorn from me. This is how Paul reports in 2 Corinthians, God replied, but the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. So that Christ's power may rest on me. How do we cope when life seems to be falling apart? Not turning to ourselves, our own enlightenment, our own secret wisdom. We trust in Jesus. Who holds it together, even if we're not experiencing that? Followers of Jesus have similar faith stories as Paul. I bet you if we took the time now, we could go out and many of you could say, here was the time in my life when things seemed to be falling apart. And this is how God and Christ held it together. Those would be wonderful stories, wouldn't they? Martin Luther experienced this. In his small catechism, he described the work of God to hold all things together this way. In Christ, God not only created all things, God also continues to preserve us, and God protects and guards us from every evil. And you may be looking at it like, okay, I get that, I get that, but you know, what if it doesn't seem like he's protecting me and guarding me from every evil? What if I pray and pray and it, it's the threat or the loss is still there? In verse 21, Paul says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. In other words, Paul's saying this, because of our corruption of God's creation, our lives... So, lives sometimes are falling apart. It's not an evil God that created the corrupt. It's our actions, our behavior, our thoughts and words that have corrupted creation. It's so broken around us. That's why we feel like it's falling apart sometimes. But the good news is that through the work of Jesus, God holds all things together for us and for our good. So here's the next step. I want you to, if you haven't gotten it already, I want you to reach in and pull this sermon outline out. I'm going to invite you to identify an area of your life right now that seems to you to be falling apart. Maybe it's something small, but can you identify it in your mind right now? What it is. You can say, yeah, that's, that's getting a little whacked out right now. Or maybe you're full blown into it. It's been plaguing you for some time. I'm going to invite you first to be present with the emotions that happen with that. The anxiety, the sadness, be aware of that. Don't deny them. That's not authentic. Be aware of the feelings. But then I'm going to invite us to roll that all into a time of confession and forgiveness and putting our trust again in God who in Christ holds all things together, okay? So, if you look in the back of your sermon outline, we're going to do this together in worship here. God calls us to live our lives under his loving leadership, trusting that God holds all things together in Christ. Let us confess when we have doubted that God holds our lives together for our good. So you're invited to meet, remain seated, or if you wish, you could kneel. Almighty God, you have rescued us from darkness and sin and brought us into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of your Son. Through your Holy Spirit, you have filled us with confidence that you have created us in all that exists. And yet...
I think an area of my life is falling apart. I confess that I have doubted you are holding all things together for my good. Now in this time of silence, identify that area. Be present with those feelings and confess where you've wondered whether God is holding it together for your good. We believe that God has given us and still preserves our bodies and souls with all their powers. And yet, I have stumbled in confusion. I have not trusted that you provide me with all I need. I have doubted that you will protect me in times of danger and guard me from every evil. Forgive me of all my sins and doubts. Reveal to me why I hold on to my doubts. I trust that you are holding all things together for my good. Help me when my trust stumbles. Amen. I invite you to stand and to hear this good news. Once we lived in dark confusion, but now we have been brought into the mercy of the light of God through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. For the sake of Jesus, God forgives you all your sins and doubts. You've been brought under the reign of the kingdom of God. Live in the light and the freedom of God's grace. Amen.